Uh, hopefully people can hear me now. My name is Sean Lydon. I am the president of Viva and unfortunately I got kicked out right as we started, but this is a strategies on the front line. And it's really one of the great sessions we do at Viva where we basically have world's experts present tough cases and we're gonna really focus in today on, on aorta cases. So hopefully in a second, we'll have the poll of who we have uh, on the call. And so we seem to be dominated by, uh, by the vascular surgeons of the world and, and not really any cardiologists yet. Maybe some will join us uh, here in a minute. But uh, with that, I would like to go ahead and uh, uh, welcome our, our panelists. And so we have uh, three world's experts. First, we have Ed Wu, who's the director of the vascular program at MedStar and the chairman of uh, the Department of Vascular Surgery and professor of surgery at Georgetown. Uh, second, we have Jason Lee, who uh, is a great Warriors fan. Despite that, I really like him. He's a director of endovascular surgery at, and a professor of surgery at uh, Stanford. And then Last but not least, uh, Darren Schneider, who is uh, the chief at uh, uh, Cornell and soon to be uh, within the next month, starting July 1st at, at University of Pennsylvania. So uh, we're going to have some great cases. We're going to kick it off with Ed, who's going to talk to us about uh, uh, up in the thoracic aorta. So why don't we go ahead and bring up Dr. Wu's slides and get started with our first case. There we go. <clears throat> that okay? Great. Yes. Great. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Dr. So uh, I'm going to start today with a uh, case of a type B dissection with chronic aneurysmal degeneration. It's an interesting uh, story and uh, certainly uh, a fair amount of debate in terms of how to treat this type of pathology. Hmm. Rosen. There we go. So we have a 53-year-old female, chronic type B dissection. Uh, she presented with progressive enlargement of the false lumen at the distal arch, which is typically where you'll see this. Um, and here's a uh, M2S representation. You can obviously see the yellow is thrombus. The, you can see the pink and red are demonstra demonstrative of uh, true and false lumen. And you can see again, uh, where typically it enlarges in that uh, distal uh, arch area. And there's the true lumen. You can see somewhat compressed, false lumen coming back. Um, and again, uh, annuals mill degeneration with uh, enlargement in that area. And just running through the axial images here, you can see it uh, from this perspective. Big false lumen there, uh, partially thrombosed at the arch, but then you can see that it refills again, small compressed true lumen. Um, and then uh, the aorta somewhat normalizes as you get down to that mid to distal uh, descending thoracic aorta. Um, you can see as we run down into the abdominal component, that false lumen is still perfused. Uh, you can see the, the contrast is run out a little bit later here and um, eventually just kind of disappears and down by the uh, inferior aorta, it, it uh, normalizes. So I, that's our first question. What is the best plan of treatment? Uh, open repair with distal aortic perfusion, observation, T-bar landing distal to the left subclavian artery, T-bar landing proximal to the left subclavian artery, or explantation of the entire aorta. So everybody will have that poll question come up on their computer, and if everybody wants to go ahead and vote, I, I think this is an area of huge controversy. I mean, I know in my last 20 years, my practice has continued to change, and I think some of it depends to me on how likely I am to pick things off or how likely I am to create malperfusion distally. I don't know if maybe Darren or, or Jason or Sarah want to comment of like what you guys like to do here. Yeah, I think this is a challenge and I think it's also uh, an interesting case. The patient's relatively young too. So, uh, you know, if there's a, a genetic connective tissue dis disease attached to this, then that, that definitely changes the answer and would make me lean more towards open surgery. But if that's not the case, then I do think that endovascular options are on the table. I think the other tough thing is uh, related to the fact that now that it's chronic, then clearly uh, persistent false lumen expansion would be typically the main reason to intervene. And uh, just based on the imaging, Ed, uh, the distal landing zone's going to require some uh, creativity to get a seal distally, I think. 
So what would you do, Ed, enlighten us on how you treated this? We can see that most of the people in the poll had felt that uh, T-VAR proximal to the left subclavian artery. And, and I'm, I'm happy to see that nobody uh, chose explantation of the aorta as a fair question. <laughs> I almost did, yeah. Uh, frozen again. There we go. So uh, we chose to do T-VAR uh, distal to the, uh, uh, sorry, proximal to the left subclavian artery. And um, we decided to use the uh, Gore TBE device on clinical trial. Um, you can see here, we have the device in place. You can see it's proximal. And then uh, with a wire axis uh, from the groin through the uh, radial artery to uh, cannulate that, um, the branch of the uh, TBE. And this is just a still image of what I was describing here. You can see, uh, the anomaly artery, the left common, you can see the um, markers uh, abutting the orifice of the left common carotid artery. Uh, again, that wire with a catheter uh, through that left subclavian artery. We typically use radial access for this um, so that, you know, you can just, it's, it's very simple. You don't have to access the brachial. Um, and then you can see that port or the branch uh, extending right at that left subclavian artery. And that's our um, intent there in terms of uh, preserving that left subclavian artery. Um, and this, this is just a still image where you can see it's all deployed. The device is deployed, as you can see. You can see the branch and you can see the uh, branch stent extending into that left subclavian artery. Obviously, you want to be careful to preserve your uh, vertebral artery and, and lima uh, when at all possible, because that's part of the reason uh, you're doing this in the first place. Um, but again, you can see that nice uh, image with the extension into that uh, left subclavian. Which brings us to our second poll question. What is the significance of left subclavian artery revascularization? None, always revascularize, revascularize selectively, flip a coin to determine. So while we're waiting for people to vote, maybe, uh, maybe we could have our panelists sort of chime in. Uh, I would say that at the clinic, some of my partners are always, uh, I sit more on a selective, but I would tell you that over the last 15 years, there becomes less and less reasons not selecting to revascularize the subclavian. I, I'm sort of now emergently, I'd rather not, but electively, I almost always do. How about uh, how about the rest of the, the group? Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that for elective cases, we virtually always revascularize the left subclavian artery. I think if you're dealing with an emergent situation with a complicated acute type B dissection or somebody with a uh, aortic disruption. Um, you know, those are cases when you just cover it because you just got to get the patient out of trouble. But otherwise, elective cases, I would ask Ron. Yeah, very, very similar approach. I, I don't think uh, that um, that you should, um, that you can walk away from revascularizing it when, when suddenly out of the emergent scenario, um, particularly if there's some complication or even some mild sort of neurovascular or, you know, neurologic compromise. And I think you just do it. So, so before we go on, what, what, what do our experts do when, you know, you're that three or 4% of patients that has that left vertebra coming off the arch. And it's a case like Ed's here where you really want to cover the left subclavian to get the graft in a nice parallel stable landing zone. We'll, we'll typically reimplant that vert. Um, you do the carotid subclavian bypass, and then uh, when you just go posterior to that uh, common carotid artery, you can off, you, it's pretty simple to find that vert. Just uh, you can transect it, bring it up, and do an end to side to the uh, to the common carotid artery. And we've had good results doing that. But I think you, you have to preserve it. I think you have to preserve it, obviously, for the brain. And then it's also a, a pretty important collateral for the left subclavian artery. So I think for both the arm and the brain, it's important to, uh, to keep it. Yeah, I we, do, we, we, we do the same. Um, and it is fairly straightforward uh, to do that. Um, I think the exception, again, is going to be the urgent case. And when I do that, I usually do angiography, looking at the contralateral vert to make sure that there's not anomalous anatomy and that, that anomalous vert is not the dominant vert before I cover it. You know, it's interesting, John, but probably about 10 years ago when um, maybe even a little bit earlier, when we really started getting aggressive with the T-bars, a lot of controversy, right? I mean, lots and lots of papers sure. written about left subclavian artery revascularization, whether it was necessary or not. And, and I think that for the most part, um, as you and everybody else have said on the panel, we've moved towards revascularizing pretty much everyone on an elective basis when we can. 
you know, for the patients that not revascularized, how often do you feel like you need to go back because of arm claudication and, 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 other, and other symptoms? I know we looked at our data when, um, when I was at UVA and we had around 20% of the patients need to come back for arm claudication, the one that were, you know, just, uh, not revascularized because of emergency or because it was a short segment and used a selective method. So um, what's your experience been to, to revascularize after the fact? I think that's a, I think that happens you know, with some frequency, like you said, that feels about right, 20%. Particularly many of these patients, particularly the dissection population that's done urgently where we would have covered and seen how they do, they tend to be younger and want to use their left arm still. I think if it's an older, much older patient, chronic aneurysm or even a rupture or something that you're doing urgently, it, it, you know, you may or may not see them back for left subclavian revesc, but, but a young person definitely you wind up uh, uh, seeing that back later when they're recovered from their from their aortic, uh, you know, emergency. And I'd agree. I think the other thing is that uh, if it's a dissection, you're likely to have false lumen feed of the of the channel from that left subclavian, so you end up dealing with it more from that standpoint than uh, than arm ischemia. I mean, I'd say it's probably ten percent. It's been my experience with really arm ischemia, and you know, most of the time it looks really bad for twenty four hours, but by the couple of days later, it's pretty good. So clearly we thought that was important um, and that's why we chose to do the uh, TPE and you can see here um, this is kind of an extent of the uh, device so extending from the um, again the common carotid artery the TPE and then a second uh, uh, tag device to overlap and you can see the impingement kind of in that mid thoracic aorta where that true lumen is compressed and again you saw that on both the axials and the um, uh, and the M2S reconstructions when I took off that false lumen. And so the real question here, as uh, Jason alluded to earlier, is, is what do we do in terms of managing um, uh, this uh, false lumen to get a durable uh, result? So the next poll question and final one is, does the false lumen uh, management matter? Yes, no, what's the false lumen? And here's the best is I think we'll probably get all of us to disagree. <laughs> um. I think over time I've changed and I'm not sure I know the right answer, but uh, I, I know if you can get it to thrombose and propagate, it's great. And when it doesn't, it's one of those nemesis that comes back to bug you for a long time. And I'm not sure how you make that happen other than covering every channel. And uh, so maybe we can say that, you know, who, who's gonna cover to the celiac every time and then who's gonna try and do something with that lumen? So how about our panelists? So I'll start. You know, I, I actually do both. I bring it to the to the celiac or close to it, and then I'm going to do something with the false lumen whenever I can. Because the main concern, and I see there's a five percent. What's the false lumen? And that's probably a question of what's the false lumen concern. And 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 just to answer that, what happens is uh, if you remember running down the axials, you see the kind of double uh, barrel appearance. And so what we're concerned about is that T var is extending only in that true lumen, um, and you know we've treated. The, uh, any fenestrations within the thoracic aorta and obviously the primary entry terror. But what can happen is the, um, the, the fenestrations down distal to the T-bar can continue to feed the false lumen and that blood flow can go retrograde back up into the thoracic aorta, back into that distal uh, arch segment. And so you end up not potentially treating the patient as it's still pressurized. And so that's, that's the argument of why to treat the false lumen. Um, so I do that, and I so I bring it as far down as I can, and then I'll also try to treat the false lumen. We can debate, you know, and talk about how you know treatment plans after uh, everyone else responds. We'll actually stage it quite a bit, and so I so I so I agree with Ed to bring it down to the celiac, and then often we'll we'll stop and then get some imaging and see how much the retrograde flow goes back up, and if if then the false lumen aneurysmal enlargement slows down or you know, if you think the patient's reliable to follow up, you might have then. Then I think you might be done. If it still persists, then that's a second a secondary procedure of all the false lumen closure strategies that are out there. But I try not to do it all in one setting. It's probably some spinal cord safety by, by you know, not 100% uh, obliterating the false lumen. I, I agree with Jason. I mean, I I think that we all know that in the long term, T-bar for a chronic dissection is going to fail unless you uh, stop false lumen flow. I think that we can all agree on that now. And I think the debate is going to be how to do that and the timing of that. 
uh, for this case, it's an elective case. It's also on a trial protocol, so I'm not sure what you're allowed to do in the trial. <laughs> but uh, but I would cover down to the celiac. I probably wouldn't do additional uh, embolization uh, maneuvers within the false lumen. I'd uh, do the subsequent imaging and then plan to come back. I think when you talk to these patients, you got to tell them that sometimes this is a project and it's a stage uh, approach to this, and it's not just a single procedure necessarily. This is not a straightforward problem. But the end, the, at the end of the procedure, like when you do your angiogram and you see the fast filling of the false lumen through a big fenestration that goes all the way up to your, you know, to the uh, just below the subclavian, would that affect your decision to to go ahead and you do something, or you always would would leave it? I know Jason and Derek <laughs> said you would most likely stage it, but if, if you see like, you know, uproaring filling all the way up, would you be more compelled to do something? No, I, I definitely would. And there are circumstances where there's a dissection involving the left subclavian with a false lumen in the, in the left subclavian. And, and you can have, you know, brisk outflow via that uh, left subclavian false lumen. I think in that circumstance, I'd chase that and, and try to close that off. But I'm not sure that I would, you know, pursue candy plugs and coils and trying to uh, immediately thrombose the entire false lumen in, in one fell swoop. So to keep us on time, Ed, let's talk about how what you did after this. So uh, what we did was a uh, what's called a Knickerbocker technique. And so we basically expand or balloon out that T-bar to basically oppose that um, chronic uh, flap against the uh, you know a total aortic wall to close off that false lumen. And you can see what happens with that, you take a balloon and you go until it pops and it's a little scary. Um, and again, you can see what it looks like here. It was really thin, obviously, in that mid thoracic segment before, but here it's now, now it's totally expanded to meet the um, diameter of the entire thoracic aorta. And you can see here um, what our completion looks like. You can see nice flow down that T-bar and obviously no retrograde flow back up past that segment of, um, of uh, where it's expanded, where the Knickerbocker is performed. But there's two really key points. One, you stayed away from the end of this device and you didn't go up proximally because I think all of us early in our learning curves did it down distally and created a new inch tier distally and we've all done it proximally and created a retrograde type A. Yep. Yeah, that's a real nice demonstration of that technique. Uh, uh, we found that if you, if you find that area right around the diaphragm, sometimes it's right in the oxbow um, where it's the total uh, true plus false lumen is uh, smaller than the actual diameter of the aorta. And you make sure you leave a couple centimeters. It looks like five centimeters there you, you kept alone. I, I think it's a real nice way to stop the retrograde flow. It looks, looks real pretty there. Ed. Let me just show yeah, you. No, it looks, looks great. I think the, the other thing is really avoiding that proximal dilation because not only can you create the retrograde type A, but you could you could cause the entire proximal end of that device to migrate. You've got that subclavian branch that could be a uh, could be a disaster. One question for you, Ed. You know, when you size these for a chronic dissection, you know, how are you sizing your endograft? I know in this case you're probably sizing it adequately so with the Knickerbocker you could get to the <laughs> true diameter of the aorta in that location. But did you go beyond that? Oversizing beyond that? Just just by a little bit. And so that's a great point. I think if you have like a 47 or no, 46 or 48, you know, total aortic diameter and it's minimal component, I think the Knickerbocker is not going to work. I mean, you could try it, but it's probably not going to work, but you probably need to supplement it with some type of um, embolization technique like we talked about. So let me just run this through again, sorry. And so you can see the, the stent uh, into the um, subclavian. You can see this is, I think, two years out. Her aneurysm is completely yeah. underground. No it's flow. Totally shrunken down. That's that's perfect. Amazing, right? I mean, when you take that out, it's you take out the pressure, it treats it, and that's really um, that's what you need to do. And and uh, and Darren, you know, you said this earlier that it's uh, you know if you don't manage that false lumen, it's, you're going to come back and it's going to bite you at some point for sure. So well, thank you. So why don't we uh, to stay on time? We're going to swish coast. We're going to leave. Uh, we're going to leave DC and head over to. Uh, to Stanford, and Jason's going to present us somewhere now in the uh, in the middle of the aorta. Yep. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Ahur, and uh, a nice to see Ed and Darren. I think we're going to move our way down the aorta. It's a suprarenal case. Uh, no disclosures. Okay. This is an 82-year-old female, uh, congenital absence of the left uh, kidney, uh, COPD, continued smoking, 
coronary disease, cabbage, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, but actually lives independently, um, gets around pretty well. Six months of vague, uh, lower, uh, lower quadrant discomfort, um, found to have an aneurysm in summer of 19, measuring uh, four and a half centimeters. Uh, sent over to me due to kind of continued uh, discomfort and um, a CT scan done um, two months ago, uh, right around COVID, of this um, super renal aneurysm. I'll scroll through it again here, and then I'll show you the, uh, the coronals and the 3D here. Access, quite calcified, relatively skinny lady from her smoking, I'm sure. And as you look at it from the top, it kind of starts right at the diaphragm, maybe right at the celiac. The single solitary uh, kidney without any significant stenosis of those. And on the 3D here, uh, a quite downward angulation to sum up to, to, to uh, both the SMA as well as the um, as well as the renal. And if you look carefully here on the coronal, an early branch um, off of the uh, off of that lone renal as soon as it comes off. So here's some measurements uh, cross-sectionally here. A 25 at the diaphragm, 34 at the celiac, a 48 at the SMA origin, 59 at that left renal origin, uh, the, the right renal origin, kind of 56 mid aneurysm. So again, this was measuring about four and a half, about eight months ago and vague, you know, quadrant discomfort, probably more from pressing on this. Um, and so if, so if we assume she wants to be treated, my first poll question was uh, open surgery or some sort of endovascular procedure. So we got the poll question of what to do. I don't know how about for our panel. I mean, you know, to me, it's kind of what's their health. Um, and then what are my options while we had a, a, a physician sponsored IDE here. It's a great patient to put in a physician sponsored ID. Now that we don't, you're gonna to have to get creative with commercial devices to try and do something. And so uh, the other option is if the lady's really healthy, you know, open surgery is still a decent choice. So. Uh, you know, I think we've got a bunch of comorbidities and an endovascular option is really uh, nice. Um, you know, we've had a lot of success and Jason, obviously, you know, you pioneered a lot of the, the literature um, with the parallel grafting. Um, you know, Darren's a great, you know, Darren's on the um, panel and he's obviously got a wealth of experience with, um, with um, you know, his IDE and, and treating it with that technique. And, and I think either approach probably would be reasonable with this patient. Yeah, I would agree. What's, uh, Jason, what was her renal function? Did I miss him? Yeah, renal function baseline 0 0.7, but at her age, a GFR is about 45. And that early branch on the renal artery, how important uh, is that? It looks fairly small to me. Yeah, like it's pretty small, about a millimeter and a half. It goes to kind of the upper posterior part of the of the renal. Yeah, so uh, I mean, whatever you do is gonna require that you reconstruct the entire visceral aorta. So it's gonna be three branches or fenestrations or snorkels. Uh, I would sacrifice that small renal artery branch because if her renal function overall is pretty good and it's just a small fraction of her renal function, I think it's uh, better to sacrifice that to get a good outcome and, and, and yep. preserve the good branch. And anything you try to put into that branch to preserve it is uh, is not going to work if the artery is that small. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, with uh, at our center, we, we would use our IDE and I'd probably use a custom three branch device. Uh, the vessels are downward going, a branch device yep. would be uh, easy to use. And also there'd be some potential challenges with fenestration just because of the iliac axis and the calcification in terms of delivering and orienting. Yeah, twisting it, getting it oriented. But, but I think it's definitely doable. Okay. I was, I was anticipating if anybody had wanted open, then, then another poll question was if you were to do it open just at your own institutions, uh, clamp and sew um, with the proximal beveled, the reimplantation of branches and kind of a Crawford approach on partial bypass or on bypass or some sort of hybrid debranching. I was just curious of the folks 
uh, logged in, uh, how they would attack it if if it was a main or if they were considering doing an open, or even those that had voted endovascular. If you if you uh, if you had if you if you were going to do an open, I'm, I, I I was curious what the different techniques since we're mostly vascular surgeons on. So I'll, I'll just comment for our own institution. And, and so I think when it's really, truly aneurysmal at the level of the celiac, we would probably put them on, on bypass and be able to take each branch off individually uh, to probably preserve time when it's just one wall and you might be able to bevel it all. I might do a clamp and sew with a bevel proximal anastomosis, putting celiac as main right reading in, but a connective tissue patient or a younger patient, you know, you're, you're gonna want all those separate, so you wanna have time. And, and yep. ability to, to take your time. Wow, look at that. A quarter for each of these, huh? The other thing, uh, Sean, I, I agree with you 100%. This is the one where I, I think uh, you need to put on partial bypass with this aortic perfusion. You know, when you get that beveled anastomosis, it's uh, it's gigantic to go from that right needle to above the celiac. And the, the chances of future degeneration are much higher as a result, you know, and then you're going on and off because you never can get a hemostatic um, anastomosis because it's, you're going to have some fluke just because it's so long. So, you know, I would definitely do this. And when, you know, when we go on partial bypass, we just always just reimplant the vessels. We never do that visceral patch anymore, right? You know, if you, if you reimplant each one, you use one of those Caselli grafts. Um, if you even have degeneration in the future, you just come in with a, a you know, covered stent across it. It's very easy. Whereas managing it with a visceral patch um, becomes more difficult. Uh, in the long and I think that's the problem when people do visceral patches, they tend to use very big grafts and you make a patchy lot, you know, and very <laughs> great in aneurysm. So but then later you have a patch aneurysm or something to yeah. deal with later. Yeah. So I'll just remind the attendees there, you know, you can always submit questions through questions and answers that I can pose to the poll. Uh, so, so don't be afraid to, to pipe in the question and answer to ask things so that we can pose them to the experts. It's your chance to sort of just like you would Viva live in the audience, we'd be throwing around the dice to ask people what you want to ask people. So please use the question and answer. So question number three is- uh, Okay, question three. Now that if if we're choosing to go down the endo route, those of you that know me know we went down the endo route, um, are we going to try to build a fenestrated device, do some sort of triple chimney, uh, modified device, and or IDE, I guess? Uh, I should have put that as a choice. And a hybrid or, you know, a hybrid D-branch. So I guess if, uh, since we, I know who our panels are, Darren has the IDE. So while we had the ID, that's always my choice. And then all of a sudden when Matt Eagleton went to, to Mass General and I lost the IDE, your choices all of a sudden uh, change. And so I, I wonder for both Ed and, and Jason and, and Sar for your own institutions, when you guys don't have IDEs, like how are you guys working on it at your institutions? I know what Ed's gonna say. <laughs> We were a big fan of chirolographing. I'll show you what I did so you guys can talk about what you, what you would do. Yeah, we've had a lot of success with chirolographs and, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's worked well. So that's, we'd go with that for sure. I think ZFEN, I see 37% responded with ZFEN. This would be a really uh, tough case for ZFEN. I'm not even sure we could actually get it done with ZFEN just because it's so high, even, um, even with the double, um, even with the two uh, ceiling rings. Uh, and well, then with regulation and everything else of the iliacs, that would make it very challenging. So Ed, for the chimneys, you know, the Pericles data that Jason reported, once you got to three branches, the likelihood of endo leaks was much higher. And, and, you know, I've never been excited when you walk out of a chimney snorkel and you still have perfusion in the sack, like how comfortable can you be when it's a large aneurysm? What's your experience been when you have three chimneys? So I'll tell you, whenever I see a robust GDA on the CTA, I'm just going to move forward and, and cover it. Um, I'm not going to, I would, I, I, I forgot to look whether the GDA was open here, but if it's open and robust, I would just, I would not stent it and I would do a two vessel. Um, the uh, Pericles data uses all different types of endographs. We use a specific endograph when we do it and the results we've had have been really excellent. Um, you know, smaller, um, smaller numbers of uh, gutter leaks. So Jason, what, take us through what you did. Yeah. So, um, so we've had a pretty good experience actually combining some things, and this has been on my quest to try to say that um, having had reasonable experience with all of these techniques um, to try to combine techniques. Um, so there was some challenging access, as you as you imagine. The plan was to put to do to do the renal with a fenestration, and then to do a parallel graph for the SMA. Um, 
So with the challenging access, we wound up putting an endoconduit uh, here because I couldn't even deliver the 18 French sheath uh, through this. I had a quick poll question. If you were going to put an endoconduit, do you like to use an iliac limb, a self-expanding covered stent, balloon expandable covered stent, or a bare stent uh, for sort of endoconduit, crack and pave, whatever you want to call it? So while people are, are voting, how, how concerned are, are the panelists when you're giving up that hypogastric when you're be covering, you know, basically with an endo solution, a, a type three thoraco repair? I mean, not excited about it, I'll say, because you're going to go up into that uh, super celiac region for a seal. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, look at that, all over too. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, we've liked uh, these limbs. Actually, <laughs> this one. Um, um, was the seven millimeter or the seven centimeter long uh, limb that you get from the hypogastric uh, from the from the Gore IBE device, which gives you a fighting chance of trying potentially to preserve uh, the hypo. Turned out here, this right at the bifurcation here was too calcified, and anything to try to deliver past that was going to break on the way up or on the way down. So we decided not to risk it, and um, uh, knowing we might need to do that, uh, uh, place you know place to drain preoperatively uh, to do this, thinking just like Ed had mentioned that we were gonna go higher up uh, on this. Jason, what size uh, limb do you use, just for the audience? It's a, well, so all of the proximal uh, parts are 16. Remember that when you're using the IBE limb, it's, it's flipped then, right? So then uh, proximally, then you can choose a, a, a 16 and 14 and a half or 12 and then distally, it's it's 16 down there. This this whole thing measured um, measured about you know eight or nine. So it is quite a bit of oversizing. Um, but in you know sort of in my experience, the iliac limbs can be oversized, and they don't wrinkle like a viabon can wrinkle and create a little uh, divot, if you will, that 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 can get thrombus. And I don't know what other people's experience with oversizing a, a gore iliac limb. I've had pretty good pretty good results with it, like severe oversizing. Yeah, I've actually usually used Viabon just because there's a wide variety of sizes and lengths that, that you can choose. The other thing that we've done in some circumstances like this is use Shockwave mm. uh, um, lithoplasty. And sometimes you can modify the calcium in that vessel where you can dilate it and introduce your sheath yeah. and uh, avoid having to sacrifice that hypogastric and, and do an endoconduit. We really try to avoid sacrificing the, uh, the hypogastric arteries when we're doing thoracoabdominal type work. Yeah, so just like Ed was saying, um, and, and to Sean's point, you know, three branches of parallelograph in our hands has, has led to a lot of gutters. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively liberal about covering the celiac. Um, I guess that kind of answers this question. I'm curious what people would do. And, I'll tell you that actually the GDA and, and the SMA were obviously wide open. So I would say I'm pretty liberal about covering it, but I have had two patients over the last 20 years where their stomach died and they joined it. So I have seen the, the, the uh, sort of ghastly gastric disasters that can happen. And, and I'll never forget the first one was a patient Roy and I shared. And uh, so it can happen. It's really uncommon though. Yeah. Okay, looks like everybody would do it based on the SMA and the GDA being being wide open. Okay, so we plugged the CLX and now we got two branches relatively far away from each other. So you can't just build a ZFEN for it. So the strategy then was a parallel sandwich graph for the SMA with then a custom single hole uh, ZFEN for the renal. So the, so the sandwich technique then obviously you create a layer of a T-VAR first, and so a short uh, 32 by 109 alpha, uh, right up to the level of the SMA. From the other groin, then I have the SMA catheterized so I can try to land my thoracic piece as close to that uh, as, uh, as possible. Um, then from an eight French brachial a sheath uh, through then the thoracic device uh, and then with a vert catheter immediately into the, um, into the SMA. So now we've got through the thoracic piece in this in this uh, sandwich uh, a seven by seventy nine uh, VBX as our as our parallel chimney graph. Uh, 
uh, with all that in place, then again, we had built a, a 32 millimeter Z fen with a single renal small fen. Uh, those of you that, when you build these as, an eight, as a six by eight small fen, you can put this down uh, 32, 32 millimeters from the top. So you've got uh, about 28 millimeters of fabric above the fabric of the, of the commercially available device. So again, from above, you're in the SMA and you're in position with your 779. Uh, we place the Z-Fen then through and then line up, and then you only have a single hole to line up. We talked about the difficulties of manipulation and lining up. If there's multiple holes, making fenestrations hard. When you only have to line up one, the degree of difficulty obviously becomes much easier. Yes, this can you comment is, on the, you have a tip deflecting sheets in there? Yeah, is that uh -huh, that's that. That's a tour guide there. That's what I was going to, that's a six and a half Oscar. Um, I've, uh, I've switched to using these exclusively to not have to deal with all the additional radiation and stuff of trying. These things I think work, work really well. This is a six and a half Oscar with a hundred vert. And then we've, we basically use this to, 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 to catheterize, to get out the fenestration to be pointed at the, pointed at the target vessel. Uh, now this is further in. As soon as we get a Rosen out there safely, we switch the six and a half Oscor to a seven Ansel sheath. I think that drives out there pretty well. And then we get a 629 VBX into position through that uh, renal fenestration. Curious on the panel, I know there was always been a lot of chatter between using ICAST and if there were Europeans on the call, a lot of Bentley graphs. Uh, we've switched pretty much using VBX for all our fenestrated uh, uh, branches. Um, there's been some controversy about it having discontinuous rings. Just curious what the panel thinks about VBX versus ICAST versus if you were a European, a Bentley for, for a fenestrated branch. I use both ICAST and VBX, although I still have concerns about VBX because of those independent rings. But in situations like this one, where they're definitely, when you saw the, the course of the renal artery on the CT scan, a fair amount of angulation and tortuosity and the rigid eye cast I don't think performs as well in that. And I think there's benefit to using the VBX in a situation like this. Yeah, I clearly have concerns about the, the design, but I can tell you that, you know, when we looked at our IDE, we certainly see more fabric issues later on with the eye cast than we did with any other covered stent. So I don't think there's enough data with the VBX, but boy, it sure tracks a lot nicer. Okay, so then this is again the 30, the 32 thoracic device, the eight French sheath, the 779 VBX in position, the Z fen. The top is deployed. Uh, the, the the 629 VBX is out the renal through the fenestration in a seven French ansel. We pop the top of it. Remember, there's only about 28 millimeters of fabric uh, to the top of the Z fen. So really, to make it a true sandwich, you need a lot more uh, overlap of fabric. So then I took. Uh, um, uh, a, a cuff that was larger than both, both the thoracic piece and the z fen piece to make the inner layer of the sandwich. So now you've got thoracic piece, uh, 779 VBX, and then the inner cuff. And then um, what you do here, then obviously you inflate first the 779 VBX, and then you balloon mold around. So this is now just a single, a single sandwich snorkel parallel layer. I've moved towards this, you know, Dave Minion gets credit for this, this eye of the tiger idea, where if you, if you blow up the balloons as perfect circles and then mold against it and then take down your aortic balloon, you can get these maximal types of gutters. He had this idea, which I thought was very clever, where then you take a smaller balloon after you've inflated it, and then it collapses it down more to an eyelet, if you will. And so here in this scenario here, after I've deployed the 779 BBX, I crush it. And then in this video, then I inflate a four millimeter balloon and then crush it and then inflate it against the larger balloon. And it creates kind of an ovoid shape, which you'll see on the, on the CT scan here. This is a nice technique, uh, particularly for a single snorkel or even for a double snorkel, you can make these more oval shape. Ed, do you, do you try to do this on, on your parallels or just if there's a gutter? Generally not. I do. I'm pretty vigorous about the kissing balloons, but, um, I'm a little concerned about creating too small of a lumen with that technique. Well, what, what I do, and I think that this is actually, you know, some I consider a little bit of a game changer in terms of eliminating gutters when, when I do parallel grafting, which is uncommon. But before I crush it, I actually post dilate it even larger in the aortic segment. 
So if this was a seven or eight, I'd take it up to 10 uh, in the aortic segment. Then I'd put the small, small like a five millimeter balloon in place, and then I'd crush it. And then you get uh, a, a, then it's a longer shape with a much larger yeah, that's great. area. Yeah, I like so that. That works, that works perfectly. And you also get much more of a lens shape when you dilate it bigger, yeah. then crush it, and then re expand it. Yeah, that's a perfect idea. Okay. So then we complete the Z-Fin uh, by um, uh, molding the uh, 629 uh, VBX and flaring it at the end with a nine balloon, deploying the distal piece of things. Here's kind of a final run. You can see uh, the contrast rapidly coming down the chimney, uh, through the fenestrated, through the downward going renal. Yeah, there might be a little hint of a, of a gutter, a little bit of a blush kind of posteriorly. We looked at it. In a couple of views, I've been, uh, you know, the ACT is still pretty high at this point. If it's a blush like this, uh, generally at the first uh, scan, it's gone. And certainly when you've uh, uh, reversed um, the anticoagulation. Uh, three hours, an hour and a half of fluoro, kind of a heavy foot. I have 1.6 gray, 87 of contrast, extubated transfer of the floor, no transfusions, a little bit of rehab on the floor because of her COPD. Went home on post-op day five. The creatinine did peak at 1.1 from 0 0.7, but came back down to 0 0.9 in a post-op before going home. Here's that's the scan. Okay. That's commendable. Three hours. That's fast for uh, for uh, you did a lot of work there. Yeah, we we have a pretty good team now. You know, we you know we always have an arm team and a groin team, and it's you know two attendings, and I kind of like doing it that way. It's just it's a cleaner way to do it. You can see as we slip by the eye of the tiger there, it's 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 lens is pretty collapse there. I actually was concerned about that, but she was eating and like, you know, happy as a clam here. I'll slow it down here as we get through this. And then the 3D shows it nice. So then there's the thoracic piece that's sealed there and then inside right there. So that's the layers of it. And then down there's the plugged celiac. There's the SMA. And then here's the fenestration for the renal with a flare. And then the renal spelling nicely. A bunch of, I think some of those dark spots are that branch that was taken out. But again, even in, in, in uh, um, three month follow up here or two month follow up here, creatinine has been stable. Here's the view of that uh, lens shaped uh, SMA. And then here's the 3Ds uh, of that. So I'll end it at that. So now next time, definitely post, post dilate it bigger the SMA. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great idea. I would lose I like sleep that. over that because uh, yeah. that goes down. It's big. <laughs> Take it to a ten, and then and then and then mold it. Then, with then crush it, and re-expand it with a five. Yeah, perfect. And now you get a perfect that's what I'm gonna do next time. Nice that's a great process. suggestion. Do you so all attendees, it's good to see how there's consensus. If we all disagree with everybody else does, and aren't afraid to say, do this different next time. <laughs> So why don't we go ahead and move to, to Dr. Schneider and he's gonna keep going down the aorta and now we're gonna deal with uh, some uh, inferenal issues that uh, become some uh, iliac issues. Okay, let me <clears throat> see if I can share my screen here. Can you see that? We yep. can. Excellent. So uh, I do have some uh, conflicts of interest there. But in any event, this is a, uh, we're marching down the aorta and, and uh, I'm gonna talk more about uh, inferenal EVAR and, uh, and iliac issues with the iliac branch devices. Um, this is a 65 year old man who had an EVAR elsewhere just a couple of years ago in 2018 who was referred to us. And he was referred because on routine surveillance imaging was noted that he had pretty severe kinking of both iliac limbs and dilation of both of the common iliac arteries uh, subsequent to his EVAR. He didn't have an obvious endo leak. The aortic aneurysm hadn't, uh, hadn't grown, uh, but there was some concern about the appearance and I'll show you that. Uh, he had COPD hypertension, uh, was on uh, uh, same medications that a lot of our patients uh, are and he's an active smoker. So this is a CT scan. Here you can see this was a Zenith device. There's a little thrombus within it, but here's the aneurysm. No real endo leak, but you can start to see that something's amiss with the, that left iliac limb. 
And both of these common iliac arteries are a little bit uh, dilated. I think this will run back the opposite direction. So you kind of look at that again. So uh, some enlargement of the bilateral common iliac arteries. This left limb is barely into the left common iliac artery now. Uh, and then there's some kinking, which I'll show you on some other uh, images. So here's a, a coronal shot. Again, you can see this left iliac limb that uh, uh, is kinked. There's also kinking of the right limb, and the left iliac limb has uh, retracted and is uh, uh, almost back in the aneurysm sac. It looks like both of them have potentially migrated north. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And so here you can see in the uh, uh, 3D reconstruction and some other reconstructions, measuring the iliac arteries on the right, it was about 26, so about 26 millimeters on both sides now. These were 24 millimeters in limbs that were put in there. And then uh, looking at the uh, aneurysm again, the, the eight, AAA had been stable. There was no obvious endolite there. So here's our, uh, our first question, uh, what to do uh, with this patient. Hey, Darren, were, the, um, were those 20 millimeter zenith limbs the old style? Like, was it an old, old, like, 15, 10 years ago Zenith, or was it spiral Z limbs that are more- No, flexible? those are, they're, they're spiral Zs, but I think they were 24 millimeter diameter. And so that, that should give you some concern too, because the iliacs are now measuring 26. Yep. You know, and I think a good point here is, um, you know, treating uh, common iliac artery aneurysms, which is really what they were, with, and especially when they're short, it's not gonna work. I mean, the durability of this device was what, a year and a half, two years. Um, that's, I, you know, ideally we're not looking for that. We're looking for more long-term treatment. And, and, you know, this is the type of patient that, you know, done somewhere where there's no follow-up. The next time they follow up, it's going to be with a rupture. Yeah. And so it looks like a lot of people want to do revision with an iliac branch device, but, but I think you're spot on, Ed. This is a guy who's not that old. He's 65 years old. Probably could have had an open repair even, uh, initially. Uh, and he's likely to live a long time, right? 10, 20 years. And so clearly this hasn't been durable in like a year and a half or two years. They haven't treated all his aneurysmal disease. And so he needs a solution that's gonna provide him some durability. So I think that, that just deciding to follow him because he doesn't have an endoleak and a stable AAA and he's asymptomatic is the wrong answer because I do think this is someone who's at risk, uh, impending risk potentially uh, to come back with a rupture like Ed said. And I think is the other much big value thing now? Is, yeah. yeah, sir, is there much value now for these large flared limbs, this 28? I mean, is there, you know, a good time to use them with the, with the Elliott branch device now? I feel like, you know, there's like bound to fail unless somebody's like, you know, much older, won't tolerate a long procedure. I mean, is there a good use for them now? Yeah, well, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that, that that's basically sealing in an aneurysm. Uh, we now have devices where you can preserve the hypogastric artery and and, and not seal in an aneurysm and get a more durable uh, reconstruction. So I think that's important. I think there is a role for them, but I think it's limited. And so not in a 65 year old, but if I had somebody who was 85, who had a large AAA and kind of an ectatic iliac that was around two centimeters, I'm not gonna put an iliac branch in that guy. I'm just gonna put in a flared limb and get him off the table because that's, that's likely to be all he needs. And Sahar, that, you know, that's a great point, right? There's a fair amount of data now suggesting that um, with the proximal aortic neck, if we're uh, going into something greater than 30 or 32, there's going to be aortic neck dilatation over time. And so there's really no good reason to land a 28 device in an iliac artery. I mean, uh, you know, do something, right? You know, you can do a you can you can do an anatomic bypass, or you can you know debranch it. You can do a, you know the the branch device. You can you know, you can do a parallel graph. There's so many options that it just doesn't make sense to do a put a 28 in an iliac. So we we have a question from the from the from the audience is how are you going to get an iliac branch through all that kinked metal? And and that was a question I was going to ask is how how concerned are the panelists of trying to push something through there because the risk is when you bring out a, a an iliac branch device, you end up with a limb occlusion. So, yeah. So I was just going to say, whenever, oh, you know, when they retract up, once you get that stiff wire in, and typically, you'll, you know, a lot of times they'll do it through and through, oftentimes they'll just straighten right up. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that this one wasn't that easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Through and through access will help a great deal, I guess. 
Yeah. So I, um, uh, I agree. I think that's a concern and that played into our strategy for what we did here. So, so let me show you. And, and, um, uh, you know, one thing we did is I decided to coil and cover the left side. And I know that I'm this big hypogastric artery preservation guy, but, uh, but now I'm dealing with a, a device that's got kink limbs on both sides. And the other thing I didn't show you was that this hypogastric on the left had about a 95% stenosis. It was barely even patent. So in that case, he had no symptoms from that. I didn't think that, uh, that he really needed that left hypogastric then, but it made it important for me to preserve the right side. So the strategy we were gonna use was to coil and cover the left, reinforce and straighten that limb. So this was extended using an excluder limb. And then we used some additional, uh, uh, I think I got an additional eye cast in there to reinforce it and really straighten out that kink limb because uh, despite the devices and the stiff wire, it didn't entirely straighten on its own. So it needed a little additional persuasion. Um, That's been my, my, my mantra as well, is that if I'm going to reline through there, I'm going to put some balloon expandable metal in through whatever stain graph I line it down through because I, I've had them kink and occlude. And so I want that plaster there. And so now... So, are you guys worried? Uh, how often would you guys uh, uh, cover uh, both hypogastrics in a setting like this? Would you ever? I would try very hard not to sacrifice both. Yeah, much older patient that 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 might still be leaking retrograde. Yeah, I guess you could stage. You know, maybe two weeks apart, just out of some belief that maybe staging it uh, could help but yeah but in in this patient 65 or whatever i think you have to keep one you you have to keep one going yeah, yeah i think this guy's 65 he he actually still works um uh he's got aneurysmal disease at a fairly young age he's still smoking he might have additional aneurysmal degeneration approximately and then you're going to get into issues with potential spinal cord ischemia if you don't preserve his this, this at least some hypogastric perfusion. So I think it is important to try to preserve it. And, and this is a circumstance that you run into, not just because he's got a kink limb, but also in somebody who comes back with an actual type one the endo leak, and you're gonna revise a, an EVAR device with an iliac branch device. So I thought it might be nice to, to go through that a little bit more. So that, that comes to the second question. So I'm gonna put an iliac branch device. We're gonna use a, an IBE device. Uh, on the right side. And when you're doing that, um, you know, how are you gonna access that hypogastric artery to put that branch into the hypogastric artery? And I think this is one of those things where as technology has changed, our options have grown because it's very different today than it was two years ago and even four years ago. And, and I've seen a lot of unique approaches to this with people using the Oscar sheet from the ipsilateral side or the contralateral side. And, but I'd probably come from the arm with a VBX and just call it a day and make it easy. And now that the VBX is, you can get the eight large and take it up to any diameter and it's 135 shaft. You can usually get it through an upper axillary brachial incision. Yeah, so I've gone to, to even with these type 1B endoleaks and revising EVAR limbs. So it's interesting, there's no consensus here, right? <laughs> People come ipsilateral, contralateral, brachial, axillary artery, you know, you know, all bets are off, dealer's choice. Um, but uh, um, I typically do these, like I did this case uh, under local incidation with percutaneous femoral access. And so for that reason, I try to stay away from axillary and brachial approaches if I can. Uh, with uh, revising prior EVAR devices, you can actually easily come around the bifurcation of those devices. Uh, Gustavo Oderich has published a technique utilizing uh, uh, a dry seal sheet that you can support with a sheet from the contralateral side. And like you said, you can also use the tour guide or OSPOR devices and even do it from an ipsilateral approach. I typically would do this from a contralateral femoral approach, but in this case, I'd already had to straighten out that limb, reline it with an additional balloon expandable stent. I really wasn't keen on trying to drive something around the existing EVAR bifurcation. So I decided to do this from a uh, ipsilateral femoral artery approach. And I'll show you a little trick that I have uh, kind of learned uh, with the IBE device to make that even uh, easier, uh, utilizing the, uh, the preloaded um, catheter through the internal iliac limb. So the, what we do is, uh, you can see on the right side here, we've actually put a 16 French sheet 
uh, up from the right groin into the aorta. And then once we've done that uh, on the left panel, you can see I've taken just a regular glide wire and I've looped it and I've kind of loaded it into another little sheet so I can load that up the loop into the dry seal sheet and just push that loop of the loop wire up into the aorta. And then, um, so here you can see here, there's the loop being sent up into the aorta and I've still got the two ends of that wire coming out the back of the dry seal. And then that's what I'm gonna load the IBE device onto. So I'm gonna load, uh, this is one single wire that goes up, loops around, comes back out. I'm gonna load one end of that wire onto the central lumen and the other uh, end of that wire I put through the preloaded internal iliac limb so that I can take advantage of that uh, preloaded limb and do this all from an ipsilateral approach. And so uh, then we push that up uh, in the sheath, pull the sheath back, uh, do our angiography through the sheath to orient the device. And then uh, again, what we've got is instead of that standard uh, through wire from the contralateral side that we've loaded the device over, I've loaded this over this through wire, this loop wire from an ipsilateral approach. And then we'll go ahead and uh, deploy the device once we're happy with the position. And then just pull this loop wire back until it's seated on the bifurcation of the IDE. And then I actually then introduce an Oscore uh, sheet over that through wire. It really helps hold it in position. And you can keep the, uh, that, that sheet in place even while delivering uh, the VBX. And so that uh, you have complete pushability and it's easy to push the device around that turn and make that turn. So we got that device in place put a uh, wire well out, usually into a posterior division or gluteal branch. We still have that looped through wire in place, holding this Oscor in stable position. And then uh, the VBX is really a game changer. It's such a, a flexible, deliverable device, even though it's balloon expandable. And once we had the VBX in device, that's when I pulled back that, uh, that, that through wire so I could then deploy uh, the what VBX. What size Oscor sheet we're using there, Darren? Uh, I believe this was an 8.5 French. And this is an 8L that we put in. So then has anybody ever, would anybody ever try and do this person and convert him to an open surgery? The young, healthy patient, I mean, I, I would say, you know, here at the clinic, uh, these are sometimes I'll convert this someone to open surgery and, and not do all this endo stuff. But this is clearly a really cool way to use the Oscor sheath. I, I got to say that you know, you see something and think, I can't wait till I get to try that one. Yep. <laughs> I've got one that I'm, that I'm ready to do, so I'm going to have to borrow these slides, Darren. I just was thinking about how to do it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it actually works pretty well. I mean, my logic, I mean, you could say the guy's young, you should consider an open surgical repair, but I think the reality is if you take this repair into healthy, healthy vessels down in the external iliacs uh, bilaterally, and those are non-aneurysmal, that I think is going to provide him with a durable result. You can always come back later and, and do an open conversion. It's not like you're putting all these snorkels into the visceral vessels. I mean, you still could convert this if you ever had to. Uh, Sean, did you uh, can kind of answer your question? I had a patient exactly like this, right? Uh, prior EVAR, uh, bilateral commons. I coil embolized one side, took it down. And then instead of doing this with an IBE, I did a retroperitoneal incision and did an external to internal iliac artery bypass and then extended down. And the reason I did that was because there was a lot of tortuosity in that internal iliac artery. And I was concerned about long-term durability of a, of a stent in, in place. So, um, so you know, it, there's kind of the in-between, you know, without totally explanting the whole EVAR device and, you know, doing some combined open uh, endo approach. So... I want to make sure the attendees get something here, but you know, I think that one of the key points we talked about is the the limbs and how kink they were. And I think one of the important parts is you look, he's got, you know, basically a catheter on one side and a floppy wire on the other side. So he's gonna let these devices lay in their normal position because we don't want it to be straightening out a kink with stiff wires when you're taking your completion pictures. And then you come out and you know, post op day two, they thrombose and and We've all lived through that learning curve. And I think that, you know, sometimes people forget that step. And, you know, to me, that's always the most important thing is look how nice and straight they are with um, at the end result here, which is awesome. I think that's a really important point, Sean. And so every time I do this, particularly when you extend down in the external iliacs or in tortuous anatomy, 
Um, I always remove the stiff wire. So this is just a floppy glide wire on the right side. And you can see I pulled my sheath all the way back down to just above the inguinal ligament. And the same thing on the other side, the sheath pulled back and just the, uh, uh, the, the uh, pigtail catheter there to do my completion. So there's no stiff sheaths or wires distorting the anatomy. This is what it's gonna look like. This is where it's gonna live and then you can make sure it's okay. So well, that's uh, some amazing, amazing cases. Uh, any last final thoughts in this case? Love the loop technique. That's uh, that's yeah. brilliant. I should draw up some pictures of that or tell the Mayo Clinic to draw some nice pictures of it. I know, I, I showed it to Gustavo already, so he's probably got his artist and he already got, wrote a fellow it. writing it up already. So. <laughs> So with, with that, I really want to thank all our panelists, uh, to Jason, to uh, Ed and Sarah and, uh, and Darren, you know, this has been awesome. Uh, for the attendees who've never come, this is what we do live at Viva. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available later on our website. And if you're not a subscriber to our mailing list, if you go on our website, you can get on it to find when we have future events like this. But if you really enjoyed this also, uh, hopefully this November, we're still planning and going live and come to our live event. And uh, this is what we do. And it's really all about just, you know, getting experts to sort of pick each other's brain. And, and I love doing these because I have a brand new technique. I can't wait to try and look at my partners going and say, where'd you learn that? I'm like, I saw it somewhere once. <laughs> Not really telling where. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, thanks everybody. And um, this has been uh, really enjoyable. We learned a lot. And um, you know, thanks for attending and everyone please stay safe. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks Bye -bye. everybody. Bye. -bye.